morning. Welcome to church. You excited to be in the house of God this morning? Come on, let's put our hands together. Let's just worship in church.
lift up our worship this morning. It can only come from the heart.
first verse. Your voices that sing that again. just a minute we're gonna celebrate life change but I just don't want to move there too quickly so I just want to stay in this moment amen we can do whatever we want <laughs> what we have planned but in a moment like this it's a holy moment and God's gonna speak to your heart and do something in you much better than what I can do so let's just stay here for a moment Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you that you sent your son, not so that we can just come to church. Thank you that he makes us a new creation. We're thankful. Thank you that you are holy. We exalt you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just give a clap for Jesus? And just if you want to explode with praise, that's fine too. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord. Yeah. Oh, man. You guys can go ahead and be seated because we've got some more 
the Jesus things happening in the form of baptism this morning. We love baptisms because it's the expression of life change. So it's an external demonstration of something that's been done on the inside, internal transformation for somebody. So we're identifying as believers through baptism with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Does that excite you all this morning? It excites me. So first up this morning, we have James Pagan. James is joined in the tank with his mother, Jessica. James said at two months old, he was presented to the Lord. Ever since then, he has been raised in the ways of Christ Jesus. He has a yearning to learn more about God. His faith is placed in the Lord and he recognizes that Jesus is his one and only personal savior. Yes. Awesome. Next up is David and Mary Kate Pluff. David and Mary Kate are married and being baptized together. David says, in my early teens, during my parents' divorce and under peer pressure, I became addicted to drugs. I'll get through this. After nearly overdosing, I went into rehab. My mother shared the gospel with me and I accepted Jesus as the Lord over my life. There was a definite change in, change in me, but I lacked consistency and strong mentors. I thought I had life figured out and that I was in control. I thought I was honoring my wife and my family by being a workaholic provider. I failed to serve my wife and kids in the way they needed me, and I hit the rockiest bottom I could have imagined. Now, with a refreshed and renewed heart, and after yet another miracle that can be only traced back to Jesus, our marriage has been restored. I wanna be water baptized to publicly declare that my faith in Jesus, and I look forward to the plans and ministry God has for Mary Kate and me and our amazing boys. Mary Kate says, I accepted Christ when I was about eight years old and I was also baptized. Since then, I had fallen away from Christ and his purpose for my life. Recently, during a family night at worship center, God tugged at my heart and reminded me of his unfailing love and forgiveness for me. I rededicated my life to him at 28 years old and have been living for him each day. Before Christ, my life was my own, but now with Christ, my life belongs to him. Yes, hallelujah. And lastly, we have Sean and Sarah Glacken. Sean and Sarah are married and being baptized together. Sean says, I was in boot camp with nothing left in me and no one to rely on. I chose to go to the services there Sunday mornings. Midway through boot camp at 21 years old, I prayed the prayer to follow Jesus at a young age, and my parents planted the seed in me that God was real. But when I was eight years old, my parents divorced. From there, I began a going down a dark path full of rage, anger, drug and alcohol abuse, along with using pornography. At a very low, low point two years ago, I battled with taking my own life. And that is where Jesus met me. I knew at that point I could not live without him and needed to start trusting him. With Christ in my life, I am free through him. The Lord has restored my heart, my marriage, and my family to something beyond what I could ever have dreamed of. I never made the conscious decision to be baptized, but here I am to proclaim the Lord's name and what he has done in my life. Sarah shares, I decided to follow Jesus when I was 10 years old and it was just something everyone did at church. I think because it wasn't truly authentic, I ended up straying from my faith. In November 2019, during an extremely difficult time in my life, I returned to the Lord. 
Before Christ, I was living a life full of sin. I suffered from anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. I had an empty feeling in my heart. I was lonely and felt worthless. I tried to fill the emptiness with substances and people. I compare myself to the Samaritan woman at the well, always thirsty. Now, with Jesus, I'm saved by grace. He is my joy, my happiness, because he is within me. I am worthy. He saved me and I thirst no more. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet this morning again. We're going to continue to worship. Let's keep our eyes on the one who brings all this change in our heart. Amen. His name is Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate this morning.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Man, he's alive and he's coming back again. <laughs> Does it excite anybody in here this morning? Oh, man. He is the hope of all the ages. He's the hope of all the ages. And there's nowhere else I'd rather be on a Sunday morning. And we've got some families here that need to cling to the hope of all the ages. So the Allgaier family, if you want to come to the front, and also the Slesser family, if you want to come to the front. We want to pray for John. His mother passed away recently. Uh, her name was Faye. So we're going to pray for this family and also the Slesser family. Uh, Steve lost his mom, Janet, recently as well. You know, we can worship God and like hang from the rafters like I like to do. And then there's down moments where we can worship and experience God. And then there's families that can still worship that way, but they're going through hurt. So we want to lift them up this morning. So God, we pray for the Allgaier family right now. We pray for your comfort. We pray for your peace. We pray that the Holy Spirit right now surrounds them. We pray for the comfort that only you can bring, Holy Spirit. I pray that you surround this entire family in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, we pray for the Slessers this morning, Lord. We pray for Steve and Rebecca and the kids, God. We pray for peace, Lord. God, we pray for peace and that you are near to us. You are near to the brokenhearted in times of trouble, God. God, it hurts. It hurts a lot but we cling to you in this season and this is right where you meet us. So I pray supernaturally that the Holy Spirit shows up, God, and heals wounds like only the Holy Spirit can do. And we're so thankful for it. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. amen. Family, we are standing with you guys. We love you so much. This is what church is about, guys. This is what community and church is about. If you wanna clap, why not? Let's do it. Love these families that even in time, of trouble and time of hurt, we can praise and cling to the Lord. Amen? Amen. You all can be seated this morning. Well, my name is Dustin, and I serve on staff here at Worship Center, and I just want to welcome you all here to WC. If you're watching online or you're here uh, in person, uh, you might notice that uh, I cry a lot, but you know what? It's all because of Jesus, so either way, no shame here. It is glad to have you. <laughs> We're glad to have you here. <laughs> Uh, something that we're super excited about that's beginning tomorrow is 21 days of prayer. So it's from January 24th to February 13th, uh, where we are going to be coming together as church family and praying over individual topics that our ministry leaders are providing. So it's a time where we really get to partner with the gospel. Partner together is community. So if you want to sign up for those prayer points, they'll be delivered via email. So you can sign up for them at worshipcenter.org slash subscribe. It will actually be coming to the e-news list. So if you get a weekly email from us here at WC, you're already signed up for 21 days of prayer. But if you want to, worshipcenter.org slash subscribe. And if you want to know more about it, you can check out worshipcenter.org slash prayer. It's a really great time where we're gonna come together. Imagine a church that comes together, all of us, and believes and prays for one single topic every single day. It's really powerful, so we're super excited for that. Well, as we prepare to give in our tithes and offerings this morning, I want to remind you that there are boxes that you can drop uh, tithes and givings on at the entrance to the auditorium by the doors, or you can give with the information on the screen uh, through texting or worshipcenter.org slash give. And I'm going to be super transparent this morning. Uh, this scripture um, found in the gospels for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want you to know God's been challenging me in that one. You see, because I give my treasure to a lot of things, and a lot of things meaning like restaurants and Netflix and like new technology, and there is this subtle whisper recently and through some discussions with folks about, are we aligned as a church body that our treasure goes where our heart is? Because Netflix is like great, you know, restaurants are great, new technology is great, but my heart is for the local church. So is my giving, my offering line up with that? And what's come up in discussion recently is that, you know what, it's actually not about your money, it's just about our heart alignment. 
And I'm super glad that God's been uh, revealing that in me and in my life. And I feel like, you know, this is part of the growing process as a believer. So for all of you, that's my, it's really a challenge. And it's tough to challenge around a tithes and an offering spot. But really, that's it for me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a promise that we can cling to. It's really about supporting the kingdom and things that will surely outlast new technologies and Netflix. So Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to partner in the kingdom of God with our time and with our resources. And we love you, Lord, and we're just so thankful that we get to do this, Lord, that this is mission central for your mission, for the great commission, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody says... Amen. Be blessed as you give this morning. Amen. Thank you, Dustin. Worship team, thank you so much. Can we show our appreciation for this team? You know, they all make it look, they all work really hard to make it look easy, but there's a huge team that is responsible for this. I'm so grateful for it, so thank you guys. Can we just pray for a moment? Lord, thank you for your word. Spirit of the living God, my prayer is that you open our eyes to see something that we may never have seen before from your word. And your word would accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. In Jesus' name we all said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, have you ever driven a car that was out of alignment? Did you ever have that experience? A number of years ago, I had a Chevrolet S10 and I needed to replace the four tires on that. And I learned a very valuable lesson about alignment. So um, when I was in my early 20s, I would what you call a saver, which really meant a cheapskate. And so for me, when we had to do a big purchase, like four tires, I mean, that was a big deal. And so I went to the tire store and there was a few options. They said, you can get this set for, the warranty was like 50,000 miles or you can do you know, this set for 70,000 mile warranty. So I made the decision and uh, I decided to go, I think with like the 70,000 mile one. So it was a big decision. So this uh, particular auto place, when they do any type of work on your car, they would also do what's called a courtesy check. And that just simply means, I'm not judging anyone's intention, but that just simply means from my perspective that we're gonna find something else for you to, that your car needs to be fixed. And so they put the tires on and they came to me and of course they did a quick courtesy check and they found something wrong. I'm a little bit cynical about this. So um, they said, your car is out of alignment. Your truck is out of alignment. And I was like, oh really? how much? And then they showed me, it was like a 10th of an inch or something really so small. And I'm like, well, how much is that going to cost? And it was like a hundred dollars or something by that. And I was like a hundred dollars, good try. (laughs) And so I didn't have it done. Well, needless to say, my truck was actually out of alignment and those tires did not last the full warranty. But I learned a very valuable lesson. The cost of replacement is much greater than the cost of alignment. See, what happens when a car's out of alignment, and if you're a mechanic, you probably explain this much better than me. But when a car's out of alignment, even though it's so small, uh, it, will, it will drift from one side to the, or the other. Uh, the steering wheel will vibrate. Uh, the tires will wear out much faster. It'll create much more uh, wear and tear on the engine. And it's really just small adjustments that are needed. Now, a few weeks ago, I had announced publicly that January 23rd would be a Vision Sunday. And as this day approached, it became clear to me that we did not need a Vision Sunday here at Worship Center. We need an alignment series. Not because I think we're way out of alignment, but I would think it's so important that the cost of whatever causes the church to get misaligned is much greater than focusing on alignment. So today we're starting a brand new five-week series called Why Church? And I hope that this series answers a couple questions or a few questions. First off, what is the church? Uh, Why does the church exist? And what is our part? Now, if you... However long you've been in church, whether it's this church or other churches, I want you just to think about this question for a moment. 
How has being part of a church impacted your life? For better or for worse? And I realize the word church has a lot of facets to it. It can be a triggering word. How has the church, how has being part of a church impacted your life? For some people, being part of a church has contributed to spiritual growth. For some people, it is how they were introduced to Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus. For some people, it's where they find relationship. It's where they find connection with other people. For some people, the church has been a great source of hurt, disappointments. For some people, the church has been a great source of healing and hope. For some people, the church has been a place where people have found a relationship with Jesus and that led them to understand that God has an incredible plan and purpose for their life. And for me personally, I love the local church and I have experienced all of those and more. So what is the church? The church is a gathering of people around a specific purpose. Scripture teaches us that the church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus died for his bride. So the church is very valuable, precious. Scripture also teaches us that the the church is the body of Christ. A body made up of many members where every member is important. So the church is a place for people to be needed and known. So the church is a gathering of people for a specific purpose. So the church needs to be aligned to the mission of Jesus because we know if a church is not aligned to the mission of Jesus, uh, a church can experience exactly what a car experiences. It can go from one side to the other. The steering can be off. Extra energy is used for all kinds of things. It can wear people out, but really just small adjustments are needed. So how do we make sure our church is aligned with the mission of Jesus? Well, let's go to the mission of Jesus. Here's a big idea today. Here's where we're gonna start. That Jesus calls his followers to be great at the great commandment and the great commission. He calls us to be great at both the great commandment and the great commission. And we're gonna look at both of those today. So let's start with the great commandment. I'm gonna go to a passage of scripture in the gospel of Matthew. And let me just give you a little bit of context for this passage of scripture. This takes place about a week before Jesus would be crucified. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He rides in on a donkey and people are waving palm branches and celebrating. It's a great big parade. It's what we would call Palm Sunday. He rides into Jerusalem, and and by this time, everybody in Jerusalem would know who Jesus is. So anywhere Jesus went, there were huge crowds of people. They're all wondering, is he he going to perform miracles? They wanted to hear what he had to say. What What was he going to teach? And so Jesus couldn't go anywhere without drawing large crowds. At the same time, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they were plotting how to kill Jesus because they saw him as a deep, threat to their religious system. They thought that Jesus was actually pulling the people of Israel, Jewish people, away from uh, the one true God. And so they were plotting to kill Jesus, and there were all of these confrontational moments in these final days where Jesus was alive. And in Matthew 22, it it captures one of these moments. And you'll feel the tension as we read this passage. So uh, Matthew 22, verse 35 says this. One of them an expert in religious law tried to trap him with this question. Wonder what, how the religious leader thought they were gonna trap Jesus. And so he asked this question, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now the law of Moses had, we know the 10 commandments, but there are actually more than 600 laws and commandments that Moses or God gave Moses and Moses gave to the Jewish people. And so this religious leader was trying to get Jesus to land on one commandment. Why? I think because if they could get Jesus to highlight one commandment, they could easily say, well, are you saying none of the other ones are important? And here's how Jesus replied. He said, you must, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then Jesus took a step further and he said, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You know, all people want to know what's expected. And Jesus made it very clear. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Number one, the great commandment is to actively, everybody say actively, is to actively love God and love people. I find it interesting that Jesus used the language of commandment. He he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Your heart is the core of who you are. The soul is what makes you alive. It's what, what identifies a human, makes us different than other animals and other living organisms. The mind is our will, our intellect, the ability to make decisions. So Jesus is saying, you must love the Lord your God with everything that you are. Yet Jesus uses these two words, you must. And that just causes me to ask a question. Is Jesus really commanding us to love God? Because my observation is that forced love never works. For example, Kelly and I, we've been married for 24 years. Do you think it would work if I would go to her and say, Kelly, you must love me? I think her response would be, "Uh, Matt, you must stop telling me what to do. (laughs) What is Jesus getting at when he uses this language, you must? It's like, thou shalt love God. Is that what he's getting at? When you think about, he's pointing to a relationship. And for any relationship to be healthy, there must be a compelling desire to know that individual. A a healthy marriage, and really any healthy relationship, must have love as the foundation. It can't just be an exchange of information. You You have to have this compelling desire to know someone. And so Jesus is saying, if you're gonna have a relationship with God, Love must be at the foundation, must be the center of that relationship. You must have this desire and this compelling desire to know God. Which brings the question to me is how do we know God? Have you ever asked that question? How do you know someone? How do you know a being that you cannot see? Well, there was this another conversation that Jesus had with his disciples about the day before he was gonna be crucified. It's recorded in John 13 and John 14. So after Jesus washes his disciples' feet, they have a meal together, uh, they have communion together, and Jesus is beginning to teach them about how he has to leave and how he has to go, and and he uses all of this cryptic uh, conversation, cryptic language, and the disciples, I can imagine, are a bit confused by it. So finally, Philip, one of the disciples, he says to Jesus, Jesus, just show us the Father and we will be satisfied. In other words, just show us who the Father is. Show us who this God is you're talking about, Father God, and then we'll get it. And Jesus said to them, you've been with me all this time and you still don't understand? And he looks at him, Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You wanna know who God is? Get to know Jesus. Pursue him, worship him. So when the great commandment is to actively love God, really it comes down to this, to know Jesus and to love him with all that you are. It's not a thou shalt love God. It's this compelling desire to truly know God by knowing Jesus and then expressing this love with everything that we've got. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, that's a great, that's the first and greatest commandment. 
And a second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what was Jesus getting at? Well, think about how you love yourself. It's not so much, you know, treat yourself. It's about how do you love yourself? How, how, what is that self-preservation that kicks in. If you've ever been in a survival situation or life and death situation, there are some survivor instincts that kick in. If you get hungry enough, your instincts will go because there's a self-preservation that we all have. We've been designed that way. And so Jesus is saying, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The things that you would do to preserve your own life, to keep yourself alive, to prioritize your own needs, do that for somebody else. And he says, do that for someone specific. He, call, he uses the word neighbor. Now, I love uh, the English language. So who is our neighbor? Let's break that word apart in the English language. The word neighbor comes from two words. Nay and bore. So first, nay. Nay simply means nigh or near. We get that. Bore, B-O-R, B -O -R, actually comes from a word, bore, B-O-O-R. And bore, by definition, means a country bumpkin, a churlish, rude, or unmannerly person. Nay, bore, who is near, right? This person who is near. Go ahead and look at the person next to you and just say, hey, what's up, neighbor? You're my neighbor. <laughs> and so Jesus is saying, the, the person who is in proximity to you, that's the person for you to love. But you have to know them. See, it's easy to love people until you get to know them. It's easy to love people just in general. Do you love someone? Yeah, of course I do. When you get to know them, that's how you know if you really love them or not. Amen. And so what Jesus is getting at, he's saying, not just love people, he's saying know people and love them regardless if they deserve it. That is the great commandment. And we know this gets tested every day, doesn't it? Amen. Just about a week ago, uh, this got tested for me, of course, as I'm putting this message together, God gives me great opportunities to put it, this into practice. And so I was at the gym and, um, you know, at the gym, there's this unspoken rule when you're on a treadmill that as long as there are plenty of treadmills, you do every other one, right? You always leave an open treadmill between. That's just not my gym. That's just every gym. That's unspoken. If you didn't know that, now you do. And so I'm on a treadmill and doing my thing. And this guy comes, I mean, plenty of treadmills around. This guy comes and stands right beside me and starts getting on him. I'm like, are you serious? And I start having this conversation. No, I didn't say that out loud. But in my mind, I'm having a conversation with him, saying, are you serious? Look at all these treadmills that are open. And it, I actually consider, seriously considered stopping what I was doing, moving one over. But I decided not to. And then in that moment, it's like the Spirit of God just spoke to my heart so clearly, louder than an audible voice. And you know what the voice said inside? Said, Matt, you need to get over yourself. Why don't you start thinking about his life story instead of just thinking how his life is impacting you? This gets tested every day. You might think, oh, pastor, you get annoyed at people? Yeah, sometimes I do. This is why we need the Spirit of God convicting us and opening our eyes to how we interact with people and get committed. This is alignment. This is what, how we get aligned. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and works it in our life. So the great commandment is to actively love God and love people. How can we be great at that? Now, let's talk about the Great Commission. Great Commission, that phrase really isn't actually in the Bible, but you'll see why it's been called the Great Commission. We're gonna to go to a passage in the Gospel of Matthew, and the context for this passage, it takes place after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Which, by the way, every person must wrestle and reconcile if they believe that Jesus actually 
rose from the dead. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our faith. We must come to that decision if we believe that or not. The foundation of our faith is not, did God create everything in six days? The foundation of our faith is not, is everything in the Old Testament, the way it's written, is that true? Then, you know, then I'll believe it. The foundation of our faith is believing that Jesus rose from the dead. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if we don't believe the resurrection is true, faith is useless. But once you have decided that you believe Jesus rose from the dead as the foundation of your faith, then we begin to see that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is not just a historical timeline, it is a storyline pointing to who Jesus is. And we begin to see everything points to Jesus and our trust in him. Now, where was I? Um, oh, so this takes place after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus meets with his disciples before he ascends to heaven. He, he, re, um, he reveals himself to his disciples as the resurrected Savior. So they are eyewitnesses to Jesus. And I want to pick it up in Matthew 28, verse 16, what happens. Then the 11 disciples, because Judas uh, was no more, the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, I want just to picture this moment. When they saw Jesus with their own eyes, what was that like? When they saw him, they worshiped him. I wonder, if did they begin singing? Did they just bow down? Were they just in complete, it was like a holy moment. When they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. These were the 11 disciples. They're part of the original 12. They didn't just hear about Jesus. They walked with him. For about three years, they would have seen Jesus with their own eyes. They would have touched him. They would have heard him speak. They would have seen him do many miracles, perform miracles, open blind eyes. They would have heard his teaching. They would have seen how he had all this compassion for people. They saw him be crucified. They knew he was buried in the ground. And now they see the resurrected Savior. And some of them doubted. And Matthew, the author of this text, is very gracious not to point out who it was. <laughs> I wonder who it was, though. See, if you've ever doubted, wrestled with doubt, you're in good company. The original, some of the original 12 doubted. See, I, I see people, and I've been in church world for many years and in ministry for many years, and I see people and I hear people say things like, God, you know, to pray, God, if you would just heal my friend, then I would believe. God, if you would just bring a financial breakthrough, then I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're real. So just prove it by doing this certain thing. And Jesus is always pointing to people no, believe first. Even Thomas, one of the disciples who doubted that Jesus really rose from the dead, he said, I'm not gonna believe it until I see him. Jesus shows up, says, hey, Thomas, what's up? Here I am, you know, here's the scars on my hands. Here's the, the wound in my side being healed, you know, here I am. And, and then Thomas, he's just like, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, you know, Simon, blessed are, or he said to Thomas, blessed are you, you believe because you have seen, but a greater blessing for those who believe and have not seen. So Jesus is inviting us to believe. And when you believe without seeing, you believe who Jesus is, who he says he is. Jesus said, 
if you believe, you can say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and it will happen because you believe. Faith is powerful. Amen. I invite you to believe even when you don't see. So Jesus came. In this moment, Jesus came to his disciples. He told them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, because of that authority I have, Jesus said, I am giving you a directive. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. All the commands. Jesus, are you serious? We have to teach all the commands. How many commands are there? Two, love God and love people. Remember, Jesus said the entire law, all the demands of the prophets are, are, are sitting on those two commandments. Love God, love people. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we don't see the words great commission in there, but when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me from in heaven and on earth, and therefore go, that means he is authorizing these disciples, these followers of Jesus. He's giving them a commission. And what is the great commission? The great commission is to continue. Everybody say continue. Continue the mission of Jesus. He has authorized them and he has entrusted this message of who he is to these disciples to continue to spread it generation after generation, year after year, century after century. Here we are in 2022, 2,000 years later about, and we're still talking about Jesus. We owe a deep debt of gratitude to these 11 disciples Amen. for their obedience to this. But how will people still know a hundred years from now, unless we take this great commission and continue this same mission. So in this passage, Jesus calls out three actions. And the three actions, these words may be familiar to you if you've grown up in church. First one is evangelism. Evangelism, go and make disciples. It means to proclaim this good news. You've heard this good news, now go and proclaim it. Go out and proclaim it and find more disciples. The second thing we see is discipleship. Teach them to obey all the commands of Jesus. See, Jesus was not just a, a, the Messiah. He was not just a miracle worker. He was a teacher. And he taught so that his people understood, his followers understood how to live this life that is different than the world that we live in. And so Jesus was saying this same responsibility, the same thing that I showed you and how to, how to teach people, all of the commands that I gave you, all two of them, I want you to continue to teach. So teaching is such an important part of the Great Commission. But then the third thing in here that might be a little bit more challenging to see is what I'm, we're, we call new identity or new birth. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just like we saw people being water baptized today. When you're water baptized, you are baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an act. And what that act represents is a new identity or a new birth that takes place when you place your faith in Jesus. And the reason why baptism is so significant because it, it, it's a visual that we get and it's an act that the person um, walks through that they identify with Jesus. So when they go down in the water, their old life is going down. And when they come out of the water, they are, they are uh, identifying with Jesus, like the, re the resurrected Savior, and they have been given a new identity. So it's this physical act that speaks of, of a spiritual transformation that takes place. And you're baptized into the, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means that when Matt Milan, the human being, was baptized, he's no longer living for himself. He has a new identity. 
And he is a representative of Jesus Christ in every situation. When you are baptized, it means you are now a representative of Jesus Christ in every area of your life. And you're baptized into the family of God, into the, the, the body of Christ, where every member is important. Every member is needed and known. When we talk about church membership, that's not a, hey, pay your dues so you can be a member. No, it's actually a member of the body, just like an arm is a member of the body. Every person is important in the body of Christ. We've been given this mission to continue what Jesus did. But how do we do this? How, how do we be, be a good witness for Jesus, a good representative of Jesus? I was talking to a young adult just about two weeks ago. And he was asking me, he said, hey, I'm, you know, in my workplace, sometimes we get into conversations, we talk about real life, and I know there's some people there that they're not Christians, and, and uh, how do you know how to take a turn in the conversation and start telling them about Jesus? He said, I don't wanna come across judgmental, I don't wanna come across like I'm telling them what to do. How, how do you know how to do that? And it took me to another statement that Jesus made in Acts chapter one, verse eight. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, he also wrote the book of Acts. And the first chapter captures this same moment that Matthew captured, it just gives a, a new or a different um, perspective on what took place, an additional conversation that took place. And what Luke writes in Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power, these are Jesus' words, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. What do witnesses do? Telling people about me everywhere. See, a witness does not go around saying, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to obey Jesus. No, a witness simply shares what they have seen, heard, and experienced. And that's a big task, and that is why Jesus said, look, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who's gonna give you that ability. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is gonna be the one who gives you the power to know how to, how, what to say in those moments and how to simply just share how God has changed, your, how, how God has changed our lives. Be great at this great commission is to continue the mission of Jesus. Amen. So what's our part in this? Because being great, you know, at the, at the great commandment, really the great commandment is for followers of Jesus to practice personally. That should be a guiding principle for you. The great commission is for followers of Jesus to practice corporately. So how do we know what our part in all of that is? Well, it brings me to my last point today. Number three is that alignment determines assignment. Alignment is first, but when we know what our, what our North Star is, what our guide is, then our assignment becomes clear. A few weeks ago, right before our two older kids, Hallie and Ethan, went back to college from their Christmas break. Uh, they were leaving on a Thursday morning. On Wednesday night, it was like the first week of January, we had a meal together, and we were just, um, you know, having some, just hanging out one last time before they'd have to leave the next day. And so um, Alyssa, our youngest, she's a junior in high school. Uh, school's not like her favorite thing, but she does well. She takes some hard classes. And she had a big test the next day. So Kelly said, oh, can someone pray for Alyssa because she has a big test tomorrow? And Ethan said, sure, I'll pray. And he prayed something like this. He said, um, Lord, we pray for Alyssa that she, you would bring back to memory all the things that she studied. Amen. And Alyssa said, Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know if I want that prayer answered. <laughs> because if God only brings back to memory the things I have studied, it's not gonna be too much. <laughs> and so Ethan said, 
Okay, how about this? Lord, I pray that the teacher would grade very mercifully and <laughs> graciously. It's just a little window into our family. But you know, sometimes we pray for God to do something that he's already assigned us to do. We're looking for God to do something and he's, uh, and he's already giving us the assignment. So how do we put this into practice in our lives? You know, I get people asking, you know, what's next, Matt? What's, that? what's coming, we paid the building off, what's next for us here at Worship Center? And I get that, I, that's an important question. But before we start looking at what's the next big thing we're going to do, I want us to take some time to look at how do we align ourselves personally with the great commandment and the great commission. And my challenge to us today, myself included, all of us, you might not feel qualified to do this, but wherever you are on your journey of faith, when you've made that decision to follow Jesus, this commandment and commission is for you. And so my challenge to us is this. Who is in your life right now who is not a follower of Jesus? And how could you be part of their story? I want you to think about that person in your life who is not a follower of Jesus. Write their name down. And instead of praying for them and saying, God, I pray that somehow they would come to know you. That our prayer would be, God, how can I be part of leading that person to you? How can I be part of introducing that person to Jesus? How can I be part of that person's story where I can just simply share what, how Jesus has changed my life? I wanna invite us into that challenge, personally. Now, for us as a church, what is guiding us as a church? Well, we take the great commandment and the great commission and we put it all together. And this is what guides us as a church, these three phrases, know Jesus, grow together, and serve our world. Know Jesus, grow together, and serve our world. You know, Worship Center started in 1977. About 20 people or so gathered the very first service. They gathered in a hotel room, not a hotel conference room, an actual hotel room where they had to push the bed aside, push the furniture, and set some chairs up. That's where Worship Center started. So when people walk in here and see this big facility and say, man, this is an amazing church, and it is, you know, it didn't start that way. But from the very beginning, this church had a passion and a commitment to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna continue it. And so let me go through these three. Know Jesus, because these are not first people know Jesus, then they grow together, and then they're over here, eventually, you know, five years into their journey, they serve our world. No, we're going to start with knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus simply just means to know him, have a personal relationship with him. Not just information about him, but to know him that compels you to follow Jesus and compels you to obey what he taught. That's what knowing Jesus is. But connected to knowing Jesus is growing together. It's easy to know Jesus in isolation, but we've been designed for relationship to be connected. So growing together, it helps us know Jesus. And knowing Jesus will help us grow together. We've been designed to grow together. And here at Worship Center, there are many ways for you to get connected in relationship. But that's not everything. The third one is serve our world. Serve our world means we are concerned about the people who don't know Jesus, and we want to be part of the solution. Jesus said, you know, the fields are ripe for harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. So I pray that for this church. God, let this be a church full of workers going into the fields, winning people to Jesus. So it's not one, you know, this, and then that, and that. All three, we, wherever you are, all three of these, we are gonna be about that here at Worship Center. We're gonna be about helping people know Jesus. We're gonna be about helping people grow together. We're gonna be about serving the world. And when all three of those are happening in one person, here's where the gold is, the fruitfulness. That's what Jesus is calling us to be, fruitful. And so as we go into these 21 days of prayer, 
I want to invite all of us to pray this, these prayers of alignment. And it doesn't start with, are you aligned with the vision or mission or worship center? The first step is, are we aligned with the great commandment and the great commission as a church? All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that the spirit of God would take your word and make it alive to us. And over these next few weeks, God, I pray that you would stir in us this deep commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. God, to actively love you and to love people and to be part of continuing the mission of Jesus. You're inviting us into that. And I pray that we'd have the courage, we would have the unity, and we would have this deep desire to reach as many people as we can as long as you give us breath here. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you just keep your heads bowed for a moment? I don't wanna close our time without giving you an opportunity to make a decision for yourself personally, for you. If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, let today be your day. He is inviting you to know him personally. Maybe you've grown up in a church and it was about rules. It was about looking good. It was about making sure that you pleased what everyone wanted you to do. But you never had that relationship with God. Let today be the day where this is not about pleasing people. This is about pursuing Jesus. This is about surrendering your heart and your life to him. It will change your life. Because you realize that God is not just watching over you, waiting for you to mess up. But he's inviting you to come to him. He's inviting you to find your purpose in him. He's inviting you to find restoration, redemption, forgiveness of sins, peace that passes all understanding, joy that is not connected to circumstances in this world. That's gonna change. But true joy in a relationship with him. If you're ready to make that decision today, I wanna lead you in a prayer. And it's a prayer that's a starting point sets you on a new path. And so if you're ready to make that decision, would you just pray this out loud after me? And I'm gonna invite everyone to pray just so no one's praying alone. Would you just pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he rose from the dead for me. I repent of my sins. And I turn from my old ways and I follow Jesus. Receive forgiveness for my sins. And choose him to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can all look up. If you pray that prayer for the first time, or if you know you just needed to recommit your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to do something that takes a lot of courage in a room like this. Uh, would you just put your hand up in the air until an usher sees you? We have a gift that we'd like to give you. There's a Bible in this gift, some other information. Uh, we wanna walk with you, because as you hear me say, this journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. So I love the local church. It's a place where, wherever you are in your journey of faith, we can walk together pursuing Jesus. If you're watching online and you're making that decision or if you want to talk to a pastor, would you just text the word prayer to that number on the screen? We have people ready to connect with you. 
If you did make that decision here, if you have some more questions, I wanna encourage you to stop by Connections, the two rooms on either side of the auditorium. Stop by there. We have a great team of people there that would love to talk with you. All right, can we thank God for his word today? And I pray that it encourages you and stirs you up, maybe challenges you in some way, but the spirit of God brings it alive in your life. And I pray that on your life. All right, would you all stand, please? If you need prayer today, we'll have a prayer team down front. Please feel free to have someone pray with you. You know, you might be facing something that seems impossible. God can do the impossible. Have somebody pray with you. And if you are new to Worship Center or newer, make sure you stop by Connections as well. We'd love to get you connected any way you can. And my encouragement to you today and moving forward is to be great at the great commandment and the great commission. All right, have a great week. Make sure you come back next weekend for part two of our series, but let's stay connected all throughout the week.